<laughs> Hold on. This is, yeah. Sorry about uh, last second BS, but uh, I had to roll out to Park City for a little bit. No worries, man. That's life, man. That's, you know, one thing, one thing I'm working on here with the show, what I'd like to see here in the future is, uh, the possibility, well, either, either me, I like doing some of these roads on the show, but also coming out or, or at some point start flying people in to come do it. Uh, nice. so it's, it's heading that direction, man. So maybe next time we'll do it here in the studio or I'll come out and see you. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be perfect. That would be, uh, that'd be awesome. But you're, 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 you're in Utah. You're in Salt Lake city, park city now. Well, living in Colorado in Erie near Boulder. Okay. And, uh, yeah. And my, uh, I came out to skate trials in, uh, what was it? October. And then, um, left, left my in-laws car here and I was planning on coming back like a week later to pick up and pick up some of my stuff. And I just, I got sick and then the inline thing started to roll, uh, and then worlds came along and then I got sick for another month. And so I never got a chance to come out and pick the car up. So I was just like, yeah, I, I had to come out and get it today. Uh, I'm, I'm leaving it at the airport for them to pick up because they're flying in Friday, driving it to Seattle. So it's was, it was just a last second trip. So yeah, we're just out here for, uh, I wanted to skate this morning, but didn't. Uh, just got done cross country skiing of all things. So. Yeah, I saw that yesterday on your Facebook page. Um, I mean, is there is there really anything that you're not doing right now? <laughs> it's funny because I drove in from Colorado. I went straight to the Ninja Gym last night. Got there at eight o'clock, <laughs> and, uh, and and my hands are like there's calluses that are about to pop. And, uh, and then this morning I was packing up the car for the for the in laws to leave at the airport this afternoon, and then. Um, uh, now, I'm, um, yeah, I, I wanted to get an hour in, so I was like, all right, let's go do this, and then I only got a half hour, so after this interview, I'll probably go skate, skate ski a little bit more, just because, uh, yeah, it, it's a blast. Yeah, I've never done something like that before, is it, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost like having, like, a long clap frame on your foot, right? In a way, um, and the problem for us is that when we get tired, we start doing this. And when you start doing that, your toes, is, you have to do the opposite with cross the skiing. You got to be more upright to keep your toes up, your tips up. Because when you push, you push to the side and then you bring your foot like forward. And when I start getting tired, I start to, <laughs> the toe starts to dive and then it hits the snow and comes in. Man, I've taken so many crashes <laughs> just because I don't know what I'm doing. I mean, I kind of know what I'm doing, but it's, uh, and it's, you can't get outer edges. You have to be on the flat. You get a little bit of outer edge go flying so it's totally different are you going very fast i mean how you can't be going too fast no i mean the only time it sucks is if it's icy out and you fall and that kind of hurts but uh yeah but i mean think about it we're inline skaters and everything we do it's like you want to see how fast you can go and <laughs> you feel like you're going so slow so you start pushing and and the coordination's all off and then i'll get tired and the cold will get stuck in between my legs and then take me out and it's, just, <laughs> it's pretty comical yeah but then you the thing is you wear usa like i wear a usa jacket so there's this expectation of this cross country skier that's just not there yeah you look all you look all decked out but it's just it just exactly. looks like yeah <laughs> well look i you know i was i was telling when i was telling um some of my friends that you were coming on, they were like, they're like, how, like, like, you know, Casey. And I was explaining to him, I was like, well, obviously through inline and stuff like that. And ice we've interacted, you know, it wasn't crazy. You're, you know, you're, you're 10 years older than I am, but the, the connection that, that we made pretty much during the lockdown, uh, the pandemic and everything where you started doing a lot of building, and um, I actually, I was, I was looking at a video the other day and it looked like it was your, your dungeon, your basement in your, in your house. Yeah. Like, yeah. like you have a whole setup in there now for, for, for Ninja Warrior stuff. Yeah. It's um, it all started, uh, you know, we were looking for a Ninja gym to go to. So the pl a place just opened up down the street from us. And uh, so we were going there and as I was paying the 200 bucks a month to go there, Mm. I was like, holy crap. Yeah, it was Hunter for me, Hunter for my boy. And um, so I'm, I'm kind of like, wow, this is you know, after a year, 
that was over two grand. And I was like, okay, I can go to the hardware store, buy two grand worth of wood and start, you know, building my own stuff. And I became friends with the guys at the gym. Uh, so they'd come over and give me ideas and things like that. So I ended up building the gym um, on the other side of the basement. And then I was like, okay, well, we want to put a bedroom here and let's use the back of the, I mean, our basement is as big as our house. Um, so yeah, it's, it's pretty awesome actually. And so, uh, so I started moving. To, well, a funny story how it really all started. Uh, Nick Hansen, one of the ninjas, he's the Eskimo ninja from Alaska. He, uh, he did a commercial in Denver and they built him uh, props. So they built a salmon ladder, they built a warp wall, they built uh, these, these obstacles and they're all green screen. So, so the commercial comes out and it looks like he's, you know, kind of walking on, you know, they're, they're making explosions when he's doing the stand ladder and whatnot. Um, so those pieces became available and I was like, yeah, well, that's the one thing I don't have and I want. So I, I brought it to the house and as I started putting it together, I'm like, dude, this is, I gotta, I gotta clean this place up. Cause there was just shit everywhere. I mean, yeah. me and my wife, we moved from Miami and we had a huge storage unit and the storage unit just went to the basement and we never did anything just sat there and so that's that salmon ladder is what started the whole rebuild um so i i, I started building walls and, and framing and all this stuff and then i built a storage unit back there so all the stuff's in the storage unit now it's it's awesome it's carpeted it's it's about 95 percent done but uh the last five percent is always just tough <laughs> Well, you got, you got like, it looked like you had like a theater room in the back and everything with some ch couches yeah. and everything. Yeah, yeah. It was pretty well yeah. decked out, man. You did good. Thanks, yeah. Yeah, pretty, big, yeah, thanks. yeah. Like from, from the original pictures I saw, like you were, you were just working on like a swinging door yeah. and how to, you know, yeah. you know, yeah. proper sheetrock and everything like that. So, so it looks great, man. Um, thanks, thanks. So, you know, something, it was really weird, obviously growing up, uh, you, I didn't know this. I, and, 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 and maybe I did at some point, but for some reason I thought it was switched. You were the pioneer of switching from inline to ice. You're the first one that did it. Yeah. For, for yeah. some reason, I thought it was Derek Para, but you did it and you, you were in the Lilyhammer Olympics in 94. Yeah. Yeah. Like how did that even come about? Cause you well, were heavy well, inline at that time. I mean, you were right. It's all I did. Um, I mean, I was getting paid. I was like, bro. So what happened was I went out and after the 93 season, I was like, okay, where do I go? I won everything I wanted to do, but I never, I never went to world championships on inline because I chose not to. I mean, I was making a living and I got kicked out of uh, the federation for skating pro, pro step. So I was yeah. like, all right, well, you made it pretty clear what I can and can't do. Um, so, uh, so after I felt like I, you know, I always, I'm always looking for things to improve. Uh, like, even if you think you're the best, you can always improve on something. And at that moment, I thought I was the best inline skater in 93. So I jumped on a bus and went out to Milwaukee to improve my technique for inline. So when I got out there, uh, I met a few people and, and a guy gave me a set of blades and this and that. I didn't expect anything. But uh, after about a, a month of being out there, I mean, I was just literally out there training, having fun and training hard because um, I knew it was going to pay off for, for inline. So got to a point where I was uh, uh, two weeks before trials, I was at a party with all these other skaters and I didn't know any of these guys. Uh, I just knew a couple of them, like Ryan Shirley Kuro and Brendan Eppert. And these guys are like partying hard. And I'm like, dude, you got Olympic trials in two weeks. What are you doing? And um, so I see this video of Johan Olof Kops. And mind you, at that time, I'm watching Dan Jansen, Bonnie Blair with these long, powerful strokes. Now, inline is just, you throw them in. So I saw Johan Olof Kops, and I was like, this is, this is how I need to skate. This is the guy I need to, to copy. So Ryan let me borrow the tape, and I watched that tape for, I'm not kidding, 10 hours a day. And I would put my body, like I was sitting in front of the TV and copy this technique. I went out and bought a video camera the next day um started videotaping myself and every day someone said you were skating better something's changing and it was just because i'm good at mirroring things and uh regardless of training or power or whatever i was just trying to copy what this guy was doing and the left you know my my everything took off really fast in, in, in a week literally in a week so then 
there's a week before trials and I'm like, well, I'm going to, I'm going to try to rest up because I was training extremely hard. And, um, uh, I was, for some reason, I'm like, let's rest and see what we can do with these Olympic trials. And I got lucky to be honest. I mean, there was, we didn't have a big base of, of athletes and, and, uh, I just came out and just sprinted a 5k because that's all we know is, is inline. You just sprint, you just go. Yeah, and I used to do a lot of time trials on inlines too because I'd race over in Holland, and uh, they'd always have a time trial at a stage race. So the first time trial I did over there, I got smoked, and I was like, "Well, it's because I haven't trained this. I haven't done this." So, um, uh, so that's why I, I I went out and just let it rip and ended up winning by a couple seconds. And then there was a week off, and then the second week I won the five k and the ten. But uh, yeah, it was a it was an interesting ride, that's for sure. But that was the start of it. Well, you even even beyond that, you kind of you went from not only not only like from inline to ice, but you were the first one to do the downstart on yeah. ice. Yeah. Like yeah. they hadn't seen that. I remembered watching that, and everybody was just like losing their mind <laughs> over you doing this. Yeah, it was one day at practice. I was trying to do this upstart, and and it was just so hard for me to get balance. And in the first couple steps were always a little bit slipping and, and, and no, I didn't feel like I was in the ice. And I was like, well, let's try this down start. Now I didn't have a glove with sandpaper or anything. I was just kind of like, okay, so I'm not really balanced well. And I took off and I was like, that's how I need to start. And it just makes sense, you know, coming from like a track start. They don't start up, they start down and then they launch out. And it just makes sense to me. And then when a few people saw it, that's, yeah, I mean, Honestly, it's definitely the best way to go. Well, I remember, I remember when I made my switch over to ice and I was up in Canada and nobody up there was doing a down start. And of course, I'm not going to do anything over 500 meters, but I got this bright idea. I was like, I need like a handhold because I had, again, just started, had no idea what the hell I was doing. No sandpaper, no glove. So I start digging my heel in. And I just take the heel of my blade and I just create a small little hole. Yeah. I remember I got in so much trouble. Oh, yeah, and, right, right. <laughs> well, I, I ended up not, I guess the ice was, was kind of, I don't know if it was overly hard one day. And when I, when I dug my heel in, I actually took a, a large chunk out of the ice. Yeah. It, and yeah. it was like, it was like probably a two by two square and they jumped my shit. They got all over me. Uh, Cause you know, they had to come out they had to refinish the ice and everything. I was like, well, I mean, I mean Dude, I watch Chad, that. watch Chad, and all of his races, he's like, and he's just digging yeah. it in to put his hand down. So yeah, yeah. it became a thing. They got, they well, got used to it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they had to at some point. Um, but yeah, man, you know, it's it's uh, it was it was really ironic. It was really ironic is that uh, uh, fourth Lacey and I, we were we did a live on on new year's and we were talking for like three hours just bullshit and we started the whole thing out talking about inline speed skating and you were a pretty big topic of that and we got into this to this discussion of you not not ever being on the world team for inline now you just said you just said that that you you never did, did you ever try out did you ever actually try out for the world team no i i only went i skated for Derek. that was it um, I didn't, I never went to, for myself to, to ever make the world. Team. The two times that I made the world team, I was skate for Joey one year. And then the next, and then last year I skated for myself. I mean, I just went to literally just kind of hang out. So I was training, uh, I was training an athlete and I was like, well, I'm going, so I might as well make the best of it. So yeah, I've never really skated for myself, but I mean, Scott Hyatt, I mean, leaving these guys out for everything. The one time I skated for myself was the 300 meter uh, one day I was warming up, it was on the road and I was like, uh, Hey Derek, do you mind if I go for it today? And he's like, of course, man. I mean, thinking I'm not a threat for anything. <laughs> like once in a while, that's the end of the ice season. I'm beginning my training for inline or, uh, for, uh, for the ice season. I mean, wait, I'm in the weight room doing things. And then, um, I get on the line for the 300 and I take off. Now, mind you, I don't practice starts. I don't practice sprints. I don't do anything. But it was a day where I was like, man, I'm out here and my wheels are actually gripping. And they wouldn't, because I usually slip all the time when I skate in lines uh, until later in the season when I'm actually training. So, uh, 
I stumbled the first 10 meters and then I got in position, took off, and then my turn was phenomenal. My, that, because it was just straightaway turn, straightaway done. And there was, you know, questionable wind, but I know when I'm skating fast yeah. and I ended up getting a third. So I was like, <laughs> and Derek was like, what the hell, man? He got, <laughs> he got fourth. So I took points away from him. But, uh, and, and so that was the only time other than uh, I mean, the one time I skated for myself when I skated for my teammates. Was in, was in a one time, so. gotcha. But I skated for Joey um, back in the day, uh, or, or, what, 2005, I think it was. And I just kind of went out there to protect him because there was a lot of stuff going on, like people coming after him and whatnot. And I was like, well, I'll go skate trials. And one, it was for fitness for me and, you know, skate with Joey. Um, and I got out there and, and dude, one race on the track. Now, mind you, I've never skated good on the track other than leading people out. I've never skated for myself. And then after Joey wins like the 200, he's just smoking everybody. I'm like, dude, you don't need my help at all. So we're in the, uh, the missing, I don't know, the last man out. Is that what they call it? Elimination. Race. Yeah, points. Elimination. Yeah, the elimination race. Just straight up elimination. Dude, I made it to the end. I, I mean, I, I would have never, but these kids were doing stupid things. You know, I'm racing kids, so I'm like, dude, this is a bonus for me. They're they're going down low, and I'm like mid bank, and I'm like, <laughs> here we go. I just yeah. drop in and, and beat into the line. I'm like, how am I in this? How am I in this race? <laughs> so I get to the the final elimination, and everyone puts their hands on their knees, and I go flying, and I'm gone, gone. Who chases me down? Joey. <laughs> Joey chases me down, but he we're wearing the same uniform. Mike. He brings Jordan Malone with him. Jordan passes us both. He wins. Joey gets second. I get third. I'm like, Joey, what are you doing, man? Dude, if I'm gone, let me go. You know, we're on the same team. And uh, so anyway, uh, we go on the road and I go, Joey, this is how this is how teamwork works. You're gonna after a few of these frame laps, you're gonna sit behind me, I'm gonna pull you around, and every time we get to the line, I'm gonna stand up, you're gonna get the points, get right behind me, and I'm gonna continue on every single lap and I'll keep it hot so nobody can pass. He ended up smoking the race, and he, it was so easy for him. And after the race, he told Renee, he's like, Casey's the smart. He didn't tell me, of course. Like, Casey's the <laughs> smartest skater I've ever skated with. Well, he's never skated with anybody, so he doesn't know. Right. You know? And and that's the thing with these strong kids. If you're strong enough, no position is bad because you're going to be able to move around easily. But right. if you're weak, if you're not, if you're not as strong as some of these good guys, dude, you need someone to help you, or you need to be smart tactically and pick and choose your battles. Where, you know, when when you got someone leading you out for every point, dude, I would love to have that love to have that because it just changes your mindset too you're like oh this guy's gonna work for me but you know i don't think joey expected that type of like dedication to like oh i'm pulling up you're getting points i ended up getting second in the race because we got so many points because nobody was no one no one, i was going fast enough nobody was able to pull around yeah so that was pretty awesome <laughs> well what do you what do you think about now like do you ha, are you watching the olympics did you see like them get uh bronze in the mass start yesterday uh, the, the team pursuit, I yeah. did not, um, I'm going to move here. It's a little better lighting. Gotcha. Um, uh, I did not watch, I watched the heat, but it's in the middle of the night. So I'm like, I'm not gonna, yeah, gonna I mean, it's, I'll be able to watch it sooner or later. Um, but I didn't, I didn't watch, but you know, I felt there's two ways you can race that race. You put Joey in and go for gold. But if you don't beat that team you're with, then you're going for bronze and you've got, you don't have Joey. So there's kind of like this, you can only use Joey. Jo I think Joey's, you can only use him once, you know, and they were saving him for the, for the, whatever race meant the most. I feel he should have been in the first race going for gold and beat those. I mean, cause they're, they're definitely capable for sure. And I, I think they kind of wasted all their, their coins in the, in the, in the first round. So, so I mean, when you still, see, they still smoke. Yeah, I mean they're fast as hell. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Um, but when you see that, when you see ninety four, you're over there. Then all of a sudden, you know, Jen Rodriguez, Derek Para, yeah, of course, Apollo, Chad Hedrick, Joey Cheek, Jonathan Garcia, uh, Stephanie Abraham, Jessica Smith. Joey Mantia, Brittany Bo, Aaron Jackson, all these phenomenal meddling, gold medalists, silver, bronze medalists, all at the Olympics. 
over the last 25 years all came after you decided to move. It's, it's, it's great to see that, you know, it, it, it's fun to be the first person that, that jumped over. Um, but what's sad is that these athletes aren't getting the correct, I'm going to say correct coaching, uh, training, because there are some athletes out here now that just need a few little, little tweaks and, and things to make themselves better at skating period. Um, but I would say the coaching staff doesn't understand the inline side of things, watching an inline skater skate, saying, okay, well, this is what you need to do. Um, inline skaters just need to get comfortable on a different set of skates. That's all it is. You know, if you, now that I know what I know and how, like I, I explained to people, I'm like, look, it doesn't mean you have to go out there and try to go as fast as you can for 5K, 1500 every day. That's not the answer. It's being on your skates. You got to be on your skates because the more you're on your skates, the better you're going to feel and, and the more you're going to get these little, the little muscles are going to fire. I, I tell people, I'm like, I bet you're a, a damn good dry land skater. You can do dry land perfect. I mean, whatever, whatever perfect dry land is, you guys got it because you do so much of it. And, but you skate like shit, you know, and there's a reason for it because, you know, I, I tell people, how did you get good on inlines? And, you know, I ask people uh, and they're like, well, I don't know. I go, well, cause you were probably at session going in and out of people and doing the races, doing fast skate. And you have to dodge people and you have to do all these moves that, that are, are not normal. And then it narrows down once you get better and better to, you know, now I'm going as fast as I can and, and I'm not doing this stuff anymore. That's where athletes kind of plateau and they don't get any better. Where you look at someone like Brittany or Heather Richardson or something, when they're skating, they're not getting a left outer edge. This is eight years ago. No left outer edge. And I'm asking the program director, I'm like, why are you guys not working on this? Why are you not fixing this problem? And the program director literally told me, well, it's instant pressure if you're not on your outer edge. And I'm like, okay, so you're just taking the entire glide out of speed skating. So why are they getting a, an outer edge on the right and not the left? So you're, you're, you can't fix the problem because you don't know how to fix it. That's what I see is some, uh, some coaches, you know, where you have to, some athletes need their blade pitched. I learned that early on that I was, dude, I was in my basement in Milwaukee, soldering blades, moving things. When I realized, I was like, this just doesn't feel right. So I, I'm taking skates apart, putting them together um, in ways that people are like, are you nuts? And, but I knew I needed a different feel. Uh, if a blade, here's the thing. If you have a skate and the blade is fixed to it, and you can't move it. You have to learn how to skate on that skate. And if your body, like if your knees and your hips, and if it doesn't work for you, you'll never be a good skate ever. There's nothing you can do about it. And if you need to try to get an outer edge, but if your blade's cocked like this, you need to cock that blade this way to get that outer edge. And some of these coaches, they do understand it now, but it's like the other day, I put a couple wedges under a, a skater's skate to pitch the blade. The coach took them out or he took them out. You know, somebody took them out. I'm like, guys, what are you, you, know, what are you thinking? This is going to help you. But people are looking for that quick fix and they don't like change. They don't like certain things, but I'm like, Put your skates on at home, balance on your skates, put a carpet down, just balance on, you know, rock from side to side. Because if you're not getting an outer edge, that means you have no balance on your skates. If you loosen your skates up and you skate your warm up laps with loose skates and then tighten them up, you're going to feel so much more stable. And if you're, if the pitch in your blade is wrong, you'll never be able to get an outer edge with a loose skate. So th there's a lot of things that people are missing that they don't even know how to coach. So you think, you think a lot of that just comes from, centuries of you know ice skating kind of being more linear and roller skating inline skating kind of being newer and it was so much discovery happening in a, such a period of time where you know it's like not everything is just you know this step this step this step this step whereas inline sometimes it went here and then it went here and then it went here and then it went here and it went back and forth and there was a lot of adjustment and change is that just yeah. a reaction of of ice being a 200 year old sport i you know it's hard to say because the way i look at it is 
you, you don't have a year, you don't have five years, you don't have four, you know, like, like everyone thinks they have time. There's no time. You know, I tell these skaters right now, like, do you want to be this guy that goes just plateau? I mean, why are you out here? Everybody wants to be as good as they, you know, they want to be at their full potential. If you don't have the potential to be the best, be it technique, power, uh, cardio, whatever, that's, that is what it is. But if you took all the top athletes and just tested them and like, all right, you have good cardio, you don't, you have power over this cardio. I mean, there's, everybody makes what they have work to be the best. And whoever's on top on that one day, you, know, you win and the others don't. Um, but I think with our, our fluctuation with, I mean, the mentality is, I, I just don't look at things the way everyone else does. I always look outside the box because if, if you just stay in, if you, if you don't do the homework and go, okay, I need to do this to get better, um, to be at the best, to the best I could be, you're, you're always going to be mediocre, you know, and there's a lot of mediocre skaters out there, ice, inline, you know, whatever it is, any sport, you know, if you want to be good at basketball, okay, you know, I'm a big guy, I'm six foot 11, I'm a big dude. How many of those people can shoot, shoot, can shoot free throws? Not many. You know why? Because they think it's not in their game. Yeah, now, they, their, in, their size will get them through. Exactly. And they get paid the most because of being big, but they don't have any talent whatsoever because they're not even putting a ball in a hole. And that's what they're supposed to get paid to do. You know, it, it's sad when you see certain things like that where you have, you have the ability to be better and you, you don't go for it. Whereas skating, dude, after world championships, I had a lot of people asking me questions. How do we get this? How does my uh, kid get better? Here's the thing. You, if you don't have the power to push your skates, you'll never be good. You know, mm -hmm. you're, you're never going to be. And everyone's like, well, how was Joey? Good? How was Chad? Good? I go, well, these guys have power, natural strength. And the one thing that I have learned is that the old school way of training on the ice was a lot of the coaches were naturally powerful sprinters or what have you. So they didn't really need the weight room as much where the Dutch coach I had from 95 to 98, dude, everything centralized around weights because if you're not stronger with power, you can't push the wattage in the turns. So if you, let's say if you had two skaters side to side, you have you know, skater A, Race skater, they're skating seven minutes in a 5K. So is skater B. You're going to take skater A out of the, the, the system. Skater B is going to keep doing the skating, you know, a little bit of weight training, a little bit of this skater. Skater A is going to go in the weight room. They're going to get more power. They're going to do some anaerobic threshold. They're going to you know, dial things in. But number one, gain more power. Now you put skater A and skater B. I'll put all my money on skater A because if you have more power, in theory, your heart rate is going to be lower with shorter little pops rather than, you know, when you, when you have no power and you get tired, what happens? People's there, you know, if you're, if you're running at, you know, 90, you know, 90 beats per minute or 90 beats, like, like RPMs, you got 90. And then all of a sudden you get tired. It starts, you know, upping. You watch people skate. They'll take eight strokes in the straightaway. And when they get tired, they're taking 10 or 12. It's because you're out of power. So you're, now you're relying on, you know, rhythm where, if you're a naturally strong skater, you don't have to worry about that stuff. But if you're not, like I wasn't a naturally strong skater. Once I got into the gym from one year to the next, one summer of training in the gym, I started getting medals on the ice. One summer. And that just proved to me that if you don't have power, you're definitely, you know, definitely not going to make it. So do you think that, that that plays a key role in why so many inline skaters <laughs> are, have been able to make a very easy transition over to ice? Because when you skate on inlines, I mean, it's a hundred percent friction versus going to ice. It's 0% friction. Um, I, I wouldn't say that. I mean, you've got, uh, different ice conditions, but again, there's different techniques and people, you know, find what works for them and make it, you know, make it go. I don't know you got someone like, uh, Joey, who I thought has been skating phenomenal for the last eight years. It's technical. You know, he's, he's strong, he's powerful. He's got everything into the ice where he needs it. And I think right now he's skating the best I've ever seen. Um, but can you put it together at a specific time? That's, that's the trick. Where coming from inline to ice, 
and why our athletes are better. It's, it's the good athletes on in lines are good on ice. You know, if you were strong, again, it comes to power. It comes to like, you got a distance skater on in lines. Okay. You have to find the technique that works for you on ice because you're not going to be this power guy to be able to muscle through, uh, muscle through what, what the stronger guys are doing. Um, I skated on some Dutch teams. I mean, I should have skated on in Holland my whole career. Should just stayed over. Um, it's just better for me. But some of the guys that I trained with, super strong in the weight room, didn't even do weights. There was one guy, Rinche Ritzma, this 200 and some pound guy. He'd come over. I'd be doing two leg leg press or squats. He'd come over with one leg and walk away. You know, his weight training program was okay. I'm gonna go do what this guy's doing. Oh, I'm gonna go over and do a Casey's. It was really. He didn't even know what he was doing. He would just go two stuff. And uh, uh, so the natural strength that these guys had, even though they technically didn't skate well, there's a few people that I'm like, how are you going so fast? They're making what they have work. And then when I see them in the gym, I'm like, Jesus, you know, you're so strong. You have so much power. And I'm like, that's, that's how this is. That's, that's what's going on. So then you see a perfectly technical skater and then, add the power on top of that. Now you have Sven Kramer, who is a phenomenal dude. I think Sven skated 80% of his career, only skating at 80% of his maximum ability because he was so good that he didn't have to skate 100%. He would just go fast enough to win. And then a couple times he'd have to be like, "Uh uh-oh, I'm a little behind, I have to push it. And he'd still win. I mean, if you look at this guy's results, he's got world championship single distance, there's a lot of ones, one, 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 and then there's like a, an eighth and a 28th and, a, you know, stuff like that. But again, I think it's all power, and you have the strong inline skaters that come over to the ice. They're still strong. And once they figure out the technique that works for them, you see them accelerate and, and, and really take off. Well, you, I mean, you know, growing up down here in Houston, obviously you had the benefit of Chad and Paul and Cheryl and a lot of that stuff. And of course, like I said, you're, you know, you're, you're a few years older than me, but I always knew you as a really like a long distance guy. Um, and ironically, like I was talking about where, where one of the things that Fred and I brought up that we thought was just hilarious was that you went out to this, you, you were here in Houston. It was Memorial day or not Memorial day. We, um, it was like a Thanksgiving meet and it was at Memorial park and you ended up like lapping the pack out there and bonnie blair was there and she presented everybody medals and all this other stuff and it was we were talking about it and then you posted a picture on your facebook page and it was for her birthday and all this other stuff and we actually i was actually at fred's house uh today for his house and he's got this picture and it's the picture from uh that day it's an action shot of you signed by bonnie blair on this calendar and <clears throat> So we're, we're, I'm, I'm looking at this and then I'm like, wait, you held the world record in the 1500 meter on ice. And, okay. <laughs> but, but still, I mean, look, I, I did the 500 meter and begrudgingly did the thousand on ice. Um, my first day on ice, I skated a 38 second 500 meter. Um, after two months of training, I got down into the mid 36s. Um, but I would refuse to go anywhere near the, 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 I just didn't want to do the thousand or the 1500. And I'm looking at that. You still have like three or four more distances on ice. And so the 1500 would almost in my mind be classified as a sprint. And you literally go from being like, like the best long distance skater I had ever seen to world record holder in what I would look at. I'll I'll back that up for a second in line in 1999 or 1998, I set the national records in both of the 1500 meters on both road and track. And then they stopped running those races. And Ah. so I, so I'm forever immortalized in that. (laughs) They'll never be beat because they never run those races again. But as a sprinter, that's what I look at. If I can do that, and I'm looking at Casey, I'm like, how the hell did he manage to make this 
He could do a 20K and just kick the shit out of everybody. And then over here also set a freaking world record in the 1500 meter. Like, yeah. Well, it, it's funny, dude, because I'm actually very quick. Like, I, I'm not a powerful sprinter, but I'm fast. Um, uh, I found a picture of, it was, I think, Tony Neese won the race. Dante was second, or Derek Harrow was second. Dante was, it was Dante, Derek, and Tony for second, third. And I was fourth. And then you got Jeff Foster and Ken Sutton. And mind you, I didn't sprint at all. Don't work on starts, nothing. And I got fourth. I mean, it's, it's a huge podium at the Orlando Classic that goes you know, way down. And um, uh, a lot of people don't realize that I've always been quick, but I never worked on sprints because to make my money, I had to win a 10K sprint at the end. I had to win a 20K, 40K, always sprint at the end. And when I, when I would work on sprints for a couple of weeks, I, I, I mean, I'm actually pretty, pretty fast when it comes, you know, in certain things. Because back in the day when we skated ice, you had two World Cups. You had a 1,505K or a 500 and 1,000. That's it. There was, no, there was no full gas for, you know, you could race the 1,500 and 1,000 or you could race, you know, whatever. And so I never got to race many thousands. Um, so the funny story is that our Olympic trials in 1998, I won, or no, I got second in the first weekend of, of the Olympic trials because I pulled my growing. And I mean, I'm skating with a pulled growing. So I'm limping off the line. I still get second with one week of therapy and whatnot. The next weekend I won. Um, oops, you there? Yeah. 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 yeah I got, I got 20% of my battery. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, so I won the second weekend. But the first weekend is the, the real weekend that people look at, you know, the big Olympic trials. But I won the second weekend. So I always had this speed, um, but I wasn't, uh, you know, I never worked on it like, like I wouldn't just go out and just do power and, 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 and sprint like that. So it's, it, I see what you're saying. And the 1500, you're right. It's, it's literally a sprint. But if you can't get up to speed, you know, and, and hang on. Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna get you're gonna get crushed. That's the worst race ever. Yeah, I'm thinking about how hard it is. Well, I was looking <laughs> at your time. I was looking at your time on. I was like, yeah, I think I I was like a minute higher <laughs> than that. <laughs> I mean, I I just I just I was I remember looking at my coach. Uh, his name was Janusz Englert. Um, uh, he's Hungarian up there in Canada, and he's training these uh, mooks like me coming in, starting you know just kind of starting out. And I remember looking at him after the first, like, like 800 meters. And I'm like, dude, get me off the ice. Let me go. Just, just, just let me go, man. Um, so you, you made, you made, I mean, oldest, uh, just go throw it out there. Oldest inline speed uh, skater ever to make the world team. Yeah. You what destroyed my goal. <laughs> Like you ruined it for me. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. I thought you were going to get back in and do some sprint stuff. I was like, all right, let's do this. <laughs> yeah, I could do it. You know what? I've, I've, I've actually really, I've started putting in some serious, serious thought. I've put out some things out there and I seriously think I could do the hundred meter, but, but I wanted to be the oldest person to make the, to make the world team <laughs> and you've ruined it for me. What was that like? What was that like? Um, I mean, that being your first world championships, um, doing it at 50 and doing it on your own, going out there and doing it on your own. What, what was that world champions like for you? It was interesting. Um, you know, I wasn't able to train much uh, just because you know, life gets in the way and I wasn't able to just do certain things that I would have liked to have been more prepared for. Um, you know, going over there, I wanted a good experience. I wanted to have fun with it and and see if I could help uh, with with anything. And and other other than how I was doing, I was observing on what I've heard in the past and what happens, and and trying to dissect, you know, why we're why some individuals are good, some individuals are not good, and what makes what makes us more competitive at that level. For myself, I went out as soon as I stepped foot on the track. I was like, nope, 
I won't be racing on this page. You know, it's just, dude, I couldn't even, I couldn't even go around the turns. And, and you'd think for me, when it grips, dude, that's whenever it grips, it's like, yes, I can finally let it rip. And I was gripping. Okay. I was just like, my legs were explode. I mean, we're just not used to it you know, it's at all. Yeah. And, um, and we were running practices and I was like, okay, I can test myself every day and see how I'm feeling. And then at a certain point, I'm like, no, nah, I'm not even going to race something. I mean, dude, anyone can go just off the back from the start. And I, I don't want to take somebody's spot if, if I know what's going to happen. So, you know, I, I, I just gave up my spot. I was like, yeah, I don't, I'm not going to let this embarrass me. Uh, I mean, I know I'm not going to skate well anyway, but yeah. I'm not going to just go skating right off the back. Watching how uh, Daniel Zapita and all these guys just skating around like three or four strokes in the turn, posting down straight away, third, fourth place. I'm like, dude, I'd be in the back fighting for position. And it's just not what I went there for. And so getting on the road, I thought I'd have a little bit more luck. And, and dude, I got out there in the stupid rain. And, I mean, I, I felt good in the heat, but it, you know, in the first race because it was just the heat. But uh, you know, saving my energy just to get to the final. And then once I got to the final, it was wet. It's like, dude, went straight off the bat. You know, it was just awful. Um, I think the biggest uh, thing that I learned is that we need to have specific athletes for specific races. And that's all they go to the World Championships for. There's no wishy-washy, you know, you don't know what you're skating until, you know, the night or two nights before. It's, it's one, you don't know what, you don't know what to train for. You know, you've got one kid skating eight races and I skated two, you know, it, it's not that that's unfair or anything, but it's like what you skate at trials and you get first and second in is what you should be skating at worlds. And yeah, if you, the thousand meter is kind of the, the one race that's up in the air. You know, you can skate it on the road, you can skate it on the track, you know, the one lapper or whatever um that one can be up in the air but like if you get first or second in any distance race that should be there should be no like oh well today you're going to get this tomorrow you're going to get that and and dude it's crushing i mean i'm 50 years old and i'm 51 and i thought i was going to get both races on the road and because my training was like okay since i'm not racing the track i'm going to focus on this day so i a week out i start modifying my training and as soon as I heard I wasn't getting this first race, I was like, well, I'm going to go push it hard today at the track. I voiced my opinion. I said, I don't agree with, you know, not getting this race because the last man out is not the race I, you know, we filled out surveys. What race would you want to race if you had your, your goal race? What race would you want to help somebody for? I definitely didn't put last man out as the one that I want to win. You know, <laughs> so you know? Cause I can, I can pick and choose, you know, when you start going for points and whatnot. So, uh, anyhow, long story short, when I heard that I wasn't getting one of the races off on the road, and I was like, I mean, my heart sunk. Now, imagine if you're a 20 year old kid, 16 year old kid, you know, you haven't skated much and you know you're not getting a race that you feel you deserve. That sucks, dude. And it shouldn't happen. It should never happen, you know? And so I would like to see change. And that's what I am taking away from the world. Yeah. Not from my own experience. I didn't really, it didn't really. I wasn't starstruck at all. I wasn't like, these guys are doing anything special. They're nothing, no one's doing anything special. You know, a couple of the French guys did you know, some good races because Colombians should have won everything. Um, yeah. So when you can always take away a little bit from them, that's always a, a bonus. But, um, you know, and yeah, I what? mean, for myself and our team, it was just so wishy washy with everything. It's like, geez. Well, <clears throat> I remember watching your videos you would post every day. And I'm watching these things, and I'm like, you know, this is a pretty good video that Casey's doing, but his room looks worse and worse every day. Like, the very first day you do a video, everything's, like, organized and clean. <laughs> By day four, I was like, holy shit, all right, a tornado went off in his room. Someone needs to come in there and help this man. There was there was just shit everywhere. It was all over, all over your dresser. It was all over the bed and the floor. I'm like, okay, all right, I guess they're busy. <laughs> Yeah, well, that was that was me just like throwing stuff out. I mean, I come in and I'd be venting, so I'm just like, I want to talk and get shit off my chest before I, you know, I usually clean up the room every night. But uh, yeah, it's, I'm not like that all the time. That's for sure. <laughs> that's funny. So you, 
you started doing this in Ninja Warrior, what, two years ago, three years ago? Three years ago. Um, yeah, just for fun. And it's still just for fun. You know, but you made it fun. all the way to what, to the semifinals? Yeah, this made year? It to the semis last year. And, um, you know, I should make it back. But right now they're selecting people for the show that are actually good athletes. Um, you know, these kids that are coming in. It's about four or five years ago, there was a transition with Ninja. Before it was just like guys you know, swinging from trees and, and being rock climbers and whatnot. And then the gyms start popping up. Now you've got gyms everywhere. Kids are going there and it's a big playground. They're getting better and better. They're there two, three, four, five days a week. And they can move their bodies in ways that us older guys can't. You know, if you have to work all day, then you might make it to the gym. You get a little bit of training and then you've got to recover. These kids are able to go almost every day. And, and five years later, you've got phenomenal ninja athletes, like phenomenal. There's, it's, it's like the Dutch, you know, the Dutch uh, have so many, so much depth. If you just put them in the Olympics, they, you know, first through 20th, you'd probably have 10 Dutch guys. So with ninja, it's the same thing. It's, it's, it's a reality show is what it is. American Ninja Warrior, reality show. They pick and choose what they want on the show. Um, and if they just, you know, went down a qualifying thing and said, okay, well, if you want to be on American Ninja Warrior, let's go. The qualifiers start here and you've got 400 people running the course. Uh, you're going to get your best athletes, you know. But the, the thing is, it's, it's a, it's a feel-good show. It's a great show that, you know, the stories are what kind of make it tick and people want to see that. But now the athletes... You know, these 15 year old kids that have been doing this since they're 10, they're phenomenal. They're going to smoke any old dude like me or, or <laughs> even a 30 year old that's, you know, and even if they're in really top ninja shape, a 15 year old or, or a 20 year old kid who's been doing it for five years, dude, they're going to, I mean, I'm last night training. These guys were running the course and I'm like, holy crap, I can't even think of going that fast or, or doing what they're doing. You know, one, my arms would rip out of the sockets but they're, they're so powerful and so precise it's it's like watching a speed skater you know you see someone who's been doing it for 20 years you see someone who's been for two there's an obvious difference in technique and, and the things there and we we'll see these ninja athletes whew, i mean they're in the next you know, five years, it's going to be even better. So. Yeah, but this is horse shit. I want to see four-time Olympian. I want to see fucking marathon winner, GM <laughs> rollerblade athlete, uh, ultimate inline challenge, downhill uh, X Games uh, competitor, Casey Boutier running a fucking course, man. I think I that's what I want to see in his Rocket 7 uh, shoes. There you go. There you go. I'm actually, I'm, I'm actually creating shoes for Ninja right now. Um, huh. just, just strictly for Ninja, uh, called series one. We're getting the rubber dialed in. We're working on the, the, the foam of the shoe is a little bit hard. So there's a lot of little tricks and, and things that make Ninja shoes what they are. Um, you know, the, but there's nothing specific for Ninja. They're using a running shoe on the course and they're using this, this, this other company that literally it's a, it's a dress shoe, but it has good rubber on it. So they're using that for, for Ninja. Um, so we're making a specific shoe just for Ninja. Um, and literally today, one of the, one of the better ninjas was testing out our shoes out in Orlando and he's crushing the, the mega wall. Uh, that's the 18 foot wall. You go for 10 G's and you know, the guy that I gave the shoes to, he's just let anyone wear them. He comes into the gym and try them out. And it's pretty exciting for me to get feedback like that. Like yeah. these young kids are smoking with my shoes. So, uh, we're hoping in the next year or two that we'll have, you know, a pretty, uh, a pretty good uh, uh, shoe to come out on the market. And, and like, it's side. like we're, we're seeing David yeah. Simmons yeah. With, yeah. with cycling shoes for the uh, New Zealand uh, mm -hmm. Olympic team and the, you know, British uh, Olympic team. And then we're going to see Casey Boutier's Rocket 7 shoes on American Ninja Warrior. Uh, it's like, yeah. it, 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 again, I go back to it and I look at him like, how fucking cool is it that you guys have had this big of an influence across so many platforms? It's fun. I mean, seeing what, uh, what we're doing right now, like all of us, even Brad, you know, who's making cycling and, and still making some speed skate. He's shoes. got some really cool products, and, man. Uh, yeah. I like, I like what he's doing too. Um, and we're going to actually, uh, uh, I'm going to start making inline boots as well. So, because people are asking me, you know, why don't you make inline boots? And I'm like, yeah, you know, 
it, it does take time to, to dial certain things in. And I've been doing it for myself, but I just don't make it for other people because I have kind of an anxiety that if I'm making something for someone, it has to be, you know, perfect. But no matter who makes your shoes, no matter, you know, how many shoes you have off the same last, every shoe feels different. You know, Marchese's made these six pairs of Marchese's and every single one, same last, every one of them is felt different. Every single one of them. So it, it's really, it's been hard for me to be like, yeah, I'm going to make it, you know, a bunch of inline and ice boots because it's, it's like if somebody buys them from me and they're not wearing them, I'm just like, well, I need to fix them and make them good for you. And that's, it's hard. I mean, because some people just, well, I don't like them. And I, I literally watched a teammate of mine get a pair of boots from somebody, try them on in a hotel room and throw them in the trash. I, mm. I witnessed this and I'm like, Seriously, you're going to put these shoes on, not even try them and say they don't work and throw them in the trash. Literally, we're in Europe, he throws them in the trash. I'm like, wow, dude, you're a special individual. <laughs> you don't realize what kind of time and energy went into those things. And, and you know, I, I felt bad for the guy who made it. And it's just like, dude, you're not even going to get feedback or anything, not even try them. Yeah, well, I mean, I was talking to Jimmy Blair the other day, and in 99, they made a set of skates for Dane Lewis. And he didn't make the team that year. And so he literally went out and took his skates and uniform and everything frames and all, and just threw it straight in the garbage. And then I guess somebody went in there, tried to dig them out and tried to sell them back to, to Jimmy and pinnacle. But, you know, but and, and, but when you're talking about that, like who better than someone like you or Jimmy Blair, people that had actually competed, know what it feels like to be out there than to make those kinds of skates. I mean, I don't think there's anybody better to do that. Yeah, it's it's fun because you know the little tricks to, you know, what you need to do to get the, the skate dialed in, um, not just for you, but for other people as well. Um, uh, but like everybody's feet are different. Everybody's bodies are different. And it's funny because I'll get some of these skates that are made by Dave or Jimmy and people are like, well, this is what I feel. This is what's going on. I'm like, yeah, but, you know, they look like they're not straight, you know, if you put the frame on them. I go, we're not, you know, these guys aren't putting the blocks. They're not putting the blocks on crooked on purpose to make you mad. You know, they're, 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 they're centered. They're straight compared to what your foot is. It doesn't look straight when the carbon's on it. It's, it's an optical illusion. But the way your brain works, if it doesn't look right, it doesn't feel right. You know, when I got Paul's, when I got Paul's uh, inline skates that first year and I was skating on them, I'm like, dude, I can't get a left outer edge. Now I was skating on bonds before and high, high top bonds. And now I go to this low top, you know, Marquise, um, and I couldn't get an outer edge and I didn't feel comfortable on it. Uh, he's like, well, it's your technique. It's your technique. It's your technique. And I was like, okay, well, I guess you ice skaters know everything. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, exactly. Yeah. So I start putting wedge. I start putting wedges on the outside of the inline boot. Um, between the boot and the frame, and I start to prop it up at the angle I needed to. It starts working better for me. I was getting a little bit better outer edge. Now I switch over to the ice. I wear the same exact boots. Still, no outer edge. And I win the 5K and the 10K. And I got fifth in the 1500. And this is after, you know, six weeks of skating on the ice. So I tell Paul, I'm like, I don't know if it's a technique, bro. <laughs> I mean, I, I just whipped everybody's ass on the ice and in line. So let's make another pair of boots. And then we got a pair dialed in, you know, he, he angled them a little bit. And so things are uh, a little bit more for my body. Per se, so. You know, I, I, when I started, when I switched over uh, 2000 from inline to ice, I literally took my exact uh, uh, Simmons. I had, I used my exact Simmons and I had them mounted and I put them on, um, on my, on my clap frame. I had a maple and I just went straight out there and skated and I, I was able to get the edges. I just, you know, it, it just, it was taking me time. Um, when you started, did you in 94, did you guys have the clap frame yet? Uh, no, it, it came out in 97. So it was, yeah, you guys um, are still on a fixed frame. Yeah. And so when that happened was, uh, it was a kick in the nuts for me because I was, you know, up and coming and, and still getting faster and faster. And it's the first world championships where you're able to wear them. Uh, I skated, I mean, the first two guys were on regular skates, not class skates. And I was the guy who got nipped by 
a distance skater for third. So I, I missed uh, third place by four one hundredths of a second. Now, mind you, this is after four races, 500, 1500, 5K, and 10K. So on the 500, I had a little bit of bad luck with the ice cleaning. Um, it didn't, the ice wasn't quite hard. And it was, anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> but uh, 1500, 1500, I skated great. Uh, 5K, I skated fantastic. 10K, I was just hanging off for dear life. But this guy in the 5 and 10K, he, you know, he took second in uh, the 5K behind Bart Beltcamp, who was skating on flat skates. And he took second in the 10K behind Bart Beltcamp. But he made up so much time in those two races that he took third overall. And so over four races, you, if you look at it in my 500 meter, the ice would have been maybe a little bit harder or sitting a little longer. I would have gained those four 100s because that's all it is. It's just that much of 500 meters gets me on the podium. Um, so, yeah, that was the year that the guys really started wearing them. So that summer I was in my basement welding and, and soldering and trying to, I, I, dude, I, it got to a point where someone's like, well, are they going to make these things for inlines? I'm like, all right, well, let me make, I took an old inline frame, a charger inline frame, and I took one of our inlines for ice bars. I welded it together, just like an ice skate, went out and skated on them. I'm like, whoever's making these inline clap frames, stop because it doesn't work. Yeah. And people are like, well, you know, why? And I'm like, because you don't need it. You know, the clap skate is to make more contact and not so your blade doesn't dig in. Inlines, you don't have to worry about that. You want so, a little bit less contact on inline. Exactly. So anyhow, um, yeah, so that was the first year they came out and I definitely uh, didn't pick them up as fast. And what happened was the strong guys that can start fast, now they don't die as much either because they're starting fast and now their toes not digging in. So they're not slowing down as much. So a, a non-powerful guy like myself, dude, I take off. Now I'm further behind. And then when I usually catch these guys at the end, dude, I, I went from being the world record holder and being the last pair in a 1500 means you're one of the best to shelling off the back and going from the A group to the B group in one world cup. And then I slowly worked my way up in the, in the next two weeks. The next week I won the, or I think I took second in the 1500 B group. So that brought me back up to the A group. And then I went to a world cup where couple of the main Dutch guys weren't there so I ended up getting sixth in the 1500 and that qualified me for the Olympics so I didn't have to skate trials so I was able to just train through trials and whatnot in 98 uh, but it was a long road I mean you go from being so confident to being uh, I mean just just the rug pulled out from under you hit your head and you're like what the hell just happened now I go from being one of the best to one of the worst one weekend man I, I was thinking about this the other day and I'm going to say this as delicately as possible. But with NBC having the Olympics out there, I mean, how bad were they just just blowing you when you went out there and did the uh, Ninja Warrior? I mean, um, I mean, yeah, were they just giving you everything you wanted? I mean, were they just treating you like a freaking god? No, it's, it's American Ninja Warrior. They don't even treat you like athletes. They, <laughs> they really don't because they know it's a show. Like, like uh, last year, you know, they, they bus us in from Seattle to a tent outside the Tacoma Dome. And we're waiting. And we're waiting for the first of 40 athletes to finish because then our 40 athletes go in. And um, so we're waiting and waiting and waiting. And then we're like, all right, you're able to go in. Now you've got COVID because you've got the six feet apart. So everybody gets their own little space. Usually you can go to the, the, the Coliseum or wherever the ninja stuff is going on. You go there. And uh, uh, you can watch on a monitor what's going on in the back. And you can kind of see all the obstacles from the, from the back room, like the green room. But here, they just put you in a totally separate area where it's like, you can't see anything. You have a television monitor, but when I got there, there's nobody running. And I'm like, oh, so then they, then they corral us through, show us all the obstacles, and they show you one person doing all the obstacles a different person every time so you can see that the obstacle it is possible to get it done then they run you back and i was supposed to run third in our group of 40 but they had eight athletes from the other group of 40 that were delayed so there were eight athletes in front of me so technically i'm running 11. as soon as we go back they're calling my name and i'm like i haven't even done the pull-up bro and they're like well you got to go to the you know, go to stage because we have to do these hero shots and stuff like that and i'm like 
So you're not going to let me warm up. Like that was the first time in my athletic career that I've panicked in competition because I'm like, dude, I could really get hurt because I, there's no place to warm up out there. Yeah. There's no bars to hang on, no nothing. So I'm grabbing the truss and, and all these things, trying to get my fingers warm and, and doing push ups and jumping jacks and running back and forth. Um, I mean, I made it work, but I still injured myself because I wasn't properly. I mean, dude, we're old. You know, I need to ride the bike for 30 minutes just to feel decent. You know? Yeah. And um, so, yeah, they don't give you any special treatment, no matter who you are. They don't, because the person that you're talking to right in front of you, they don't know you. They don't care. They just know that there's an athlete that needs to get out there. Um, and then you have a producer speaking in their, in their mic, if you're in their head saying, oh, yeah, we need to get this athlete back for another interview because they did, you know, they did well. So it's. When I'm doing interviews and things, the people that are interviewing me, they know who I am and my story and, and they enjoy it. They love it. But uh, the people, when you're on the show, dude, you are, you are a, a sheep being herded right through just like everybody else. It's a joke. Yeah, I just imagine. I mean, I, I, in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, my God, he's got to be treated like a freaking king out there, man. He's like he's Olympic, you know, Olympic hero, all this other <laughs> stuff. He's influenced all these other things, man. That's bullshit. Uh, nope. We need to we need nope. to write some hey, everybody watching this needs to write some fucking letters to NBC and say more Casey booty a uh, time on, yeah. on the American Ninja Warrior. <laughs> well, you know, you can tell these guys that you're blue in the face what they need to do, but they, they don't care. Like. We're in Tacoma three three years ago when I was on the show, uh, two years ago, whatever whatever it was. Um, I literally like from Tacoma, doing Ninja in Tacoma. There's a stand, there's stands full of people. They just announce your name walking up. They don't say, you know, four time Olympian from Tacoma, Washington. Casey they don't say anything. They just Casey Boudier, and you walk up on stage and you got to wave and act like you know there's something going on when there's really <laughs> nothing going. on. And they want you to do something stupid up there so you get on TV. Um, and so it's, it, it's really, it's, it's great television, but it's not live. It's not good live, that's for sure. So it's kind of a bummer when you, when you see it like that. And I mean, it's literally a competition where, it, I mean, it's fantastic. I love it. But it's more, it, it's all about what they can do for television time. So for, for the you, people watching, it is tough. Are you planning on doing any more? Yeah, yeah, I got the call this year. I just haven't posted anything about it because um, I want to do something kind of funny uh, the way I'm going to post it. Uh, everybody, as soon as they get the call, they post it up. You know, I got the call to be on American Corner. And I want to do something, you know, you know, with the Island Boys coming out and being, you know, <laughs> I'm, I mean, disgustingly popular. Dude, that just drives me nuts. So I want to oh, make like a skating video, a skating video kind of like, with the island boys theme calling it dry land boys you know get get a couple people doing dry land and just being just not stupid like, dude if these guys can make it like i told the, i told uh, a bunch of speed skaters back in the day i was like dude we need to make a record look at the people making records it's just it's a joke you just need to do stupid stuff and you'll be fine and so you know i haven't posted anything just yet i'm just trying to wait for the right time but yeah i'll be on this season we start taping in uh uh like five six weeks so where are you guys gonna be in san antonio Ooh, hey okay man there you go dude just let me know when you're in town i'm gonna come out and see you there you go that's I'll, two uh, hours away man we could we could do a we could do an interview that's I'll right we'll do free, one in person yeah. Yeah. yeah well um yeah, going back to the Island Boys thing, man, what you should do is start getting on that Patreon, man. Get out there and, you know, man, Casey Boutier, I'm, you know, I'm the best thing in the world. I'm the best thing since sliced bread. Happy birthday, <laughs> Joe, jackass, whoever. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, dude. Because that's, that's like, what those guys are doing. I mean, they're making yeah. hundreds of thousands of dollars by getting on Patreon and saying happy birthday to people. Or I think someone even used them. I read an article the other day, someone used them to quit their job. Oh yeah. yeah. To announce wow. to, yeah. To walk out and quit their job. Someone, someone paid them like 30 bucks to say something into a camera, some dumb shit into a camera to, to quit their job. Uh, yeah, yeah. Man, you could yeah, do that. Yeah. that. That there's my million dollar bill. You never yeah. even have to skate anymore. You just <laughs> hire me, hire me for your resignation videos there you, you go <laughs> oh my god 
Well, look, man, I know your phone. I know you're sitting there and I appreciate you letting me know ahead of time your phone's uh, going to die. I know you got to get back on the road and everything. But, um, man, I, I, Casey, I want to I, I, I try to leave all my shows kind of with a positive thing. And I want to say that, uh, man, what you've done for our sport, I think it's really underappreciated. Um, someone was joking around the other day when I told him I was going to bring you on. They're like, yeah, ask him, ask him what it was like to be the best athlete that never did it. And I'm like, yeah, but at the same time, I'm like, does it really, does it really qualify? Do you have to, do you have to look, if we only look at, you know, gold medals here, 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 does that mean that's the best person ever? Or do you look at a total career of somebody and say this amazing stuff that they did? And though what was said was pretty funny in reality, look what you started. Look what you started. There are, there are 12 people at the Olympics today on long track and, and short track that came from inline for something you started literally 20 or 30, 30 28 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny. You know, someone can say, people can say that, but they don't know the story. Yeah. That's the thing. They don't know, you know, I was well on my way to winning medals in 98. I'm 28 years old, fantastic shape. I've got everything, you know, going my way and a new skate comes out. Dude, you, you, you can't be the one at, at, at Worlds, uh, you know, you, you can't go to, to a World Championships not being prepared for a bank track that you've never skated on. You know, you, you, can, do, you can say all you want. Um, and in 2002, I hurt my back in, in 2001 being in the best shape of my life, uh, preparing for the 1,000 and 1,500, which made it so I couldn't even start. And pulling off a fifth place at the Olympics in the 5K, a race that I was not training for, that's, you know, pretty special. But, you know, winning a medal, if it, it's a bummer that I didn't get one. Um, and even in the team pursuit in 2006, I just had a rough year. Derek and I both had a bad year in 2006, um, which me, him, and Chad should have been the ones skating in that semifinal where, it should have been us. Uh, that was the Shawnee, medals. the Shawnee Davis year, right? Yeah, that wasn't even a deal. That was, okay. but it was more me and Derek and Chad, and you had to skate together, and they yeah. put Charles Levier um, in, and that was when the pushing thing from inline became a rule. You can't push in races, and because Rollerblade was was doing this push, and it became a rule where no more pushing because. It gives you a huge advantage of speed and blah, blah, blah. So I was like, well, let's do it on the ice. We started doing it on the ice. We saw a half a second to a full second a lap faster. It was incredible how much faster we would go. So at the Olympics, you know, Chad already won his gold in the 5K. Hey, we're in the locker room. And I'm like, guys, you got to remember to push. Have to remember to push. What Chad said was, we just got to think about going fast. All we got to do is go fast. It's easy to say that when you're the strongest person. Yeah. Now, yeah. <laughs> when you're out there skating and you're struggling and no one's pushing you from behind, like Ryan was supposed to be pushing me, I wasn't getting much. I wasn't getting much at all. So I'm up, I'm in the front, definitely slowing down. He's not pushing. So when he's in the front, when Ryan's in the front and there's two laps to go, I'm yelling, do not come back. Because if he comes back, he's going to get shelled off the back because Chad's going to sprint. And, and Ryan and I are not going to hang with him. So anyhow, I mean, it's, it sucks because that should have been my year to win a medal, whether it was gold, bronze, whatever, it doesn't matter. But um, yeah, it does suck to not have a medal in my pocket. But, you know, for, for a lot of people, um, they just don't know what I went through and I've never told anybody yet. Who knows that I blew my back out in the summer of 2001 when I was the strongest I've ever been in my life. And who knows in 1997, a new skate came out. They know about it, but they don't understand what happened to me. You know, I, I go from being the best to the worst in one week, you know, so, and then coming back and getting a fifth place, it's, it's pretty positive, but, you know, and it's, it's not easy. Not everybody can win every day. Well, look, not everybody can be Chad Hedrick. Not everybody can be Eric Hyden. Um, yeah. But at the end of the day, I mean, like I said, what, what really defines a champion when you have, okay, right. that's great. You won, you won medals at, at, at the Olympic level and that's fantastic. That's a whole other level, but you created a landslide. You could literally be considered, uh, I don't want to, not the grandfather, but you could be the father of, of that transition. Yeah. I mean, you're literally, yeah. you're literally, you know, you're heavily responsible for that, man. 
And I think by 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 and large, that self outweighs anything that you could have accomplished individually because collectively you have made every so many dreams come true. And in the grand scheme of things, isn't that better? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's funny. Joey chief um, years ago said, look, if you wouldn't have come over in 94, that means it wouldn't have been in the seed wouldn't have been planted for 98. 2002 because if i wouldn't come over in 94 the people that even had the idea because 98 is when the push really started mm-hmm. if i would have come over in 95 96 no olympics no nothing go to the 98 olympics then the ball starts to get rolling there's no apollo ono in 2002 there's no joey cheek in 2002 there's no jen rodriguez in 2002 we're not winning medals in 2002 so the the, the slide from it's not going to get going. It's not going to go faster and faster. It's not going to get better. It's going to be slower because we started later. So yeah, with me starting in 94 and it was funny because a lot of people thought, you know, if you beat me in an inline race, it doesn't mean you're better than, me. you know, it, it really doesn't. It's like, yeah, you beat me in this one race. So if you come over to the ice, you're going to be better. Than me. Some people that have beat me in inline races come over to the ice and can't skate. This is between 94 and 98. Yeah. Chad Smith, Derek Downing. I mean, those guys could have been great. Um, and they were very good on the ice, but they just had, there was a few things that they needed to dial in, but they were still skating inlines too. And I was, I was doing a little bit of inline, more ice training. So there's, there's uh, these little things that, that if I wouldn't have come over in 94, there, half the athletes out there now probably wouldn't be there because, and Joey was right. He's like, Joey uh, uh, Cheek was right. And I didn't even think of it like that. He's like, dude, you wouldn't have come over in 94. I would have never met you. So, because, you know, Joey and I, he stayed on my couch when he started skating. You're right. Yeah. In Milwaukee. You yeah. Know? So all these things is like, yeah, I, I, I mean, I would have never had my chance to come out and train in Salt Lake City in 2001. So in 2002, I would have never gotten a medal. And that's all because of me starting when I did. So, yeah, it's kind of fun to think of, you know, the, the snowball's really big right now. It's rolling. And, um, you know, hopefully we can, keep this going for the next couple of Olympics and, and, you know, just with Aaron winning her gold and, and the guys winning, you know, Joey finally getting a medal and, and stuff like that. Uh, the one thing I want to say to a lot of people is it's not easy. You know, Joey's been doing this a long time. Aaron, you know, has done this for five years. She wasn't doing much else other than this. And mind you, it just popped this season. The other season, it wasn't where it is now. So there was you know, something clicked. She started skating way faster, um, you know, and now she's an Olympic gold medalist. So it's, it's, uh, it, it's definitely, uh, I think the future is bright as long as we can keep the athletes in the sport of inline. And if they come over to the ice and don't succeed, go back to inline, dude. Don't, yeah. don't just quit. You know, there's no reason to stop skating. And, um, you know, there's, there's so much positivity. That Are you calling me out? Is that, is that what you're saying? Is that you're saying? Exactly, dude. You, you're, you're letting the dream die. You haven't even, uh, you haven't even fallen asleep yet. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll see. I, like I said, I said, you get this meatball, you get this, you know, meatball heading downhill, and I could probably generate cool. some speed, man. I got a hell well, of a start, but. Dude, and that's the thing, bro. If we can get it to where we select the 100 meter is one race at, at trials. Yeah, I guarantee you, Marcus, yeah. the guy who won the hundred meter, could have won at Worlds. He was getting better and better and better as we we're ramping up to trials. And then, I mean, the guy is fast. He just, you know, he jumped out of the two hundred meter. Should he be eliminated from the entire World Championships? From, you know, he's the fastest hundred meter by far, and now he's not able to go to Worlds because of our selection procedure, which is, you know, a big joke anyway. Crazy yeah. bullshit. Yeah. Exactly. Well, well, man, look, I know your phone's about to die, Casey. Um, so man, but just look, I just want to say, I, I, I want to say it to you directly. And I would love to be able to say it to you here in San Antonio. When you guys come down, you just shoot me a message, yeah. man. And I will be in San Antonio to cheer you on. Cause you know what? We don't have, sure. we don't have all the crazy mandate restriction bullshit here in Texas. It's still a free country down here, man. Probably why we're down there. There you go. <laughs> So, man, we'll come out. I'll come out. We'll have some, we'll have a good time, man. We'll go out to eat and everything. Come out and see you. Bring, bring forth down, man. We'll have a, we'll be a good time. I'll see if I can get you guys on my sidelines. Dude, it'd be we'll, fantastic. We'll see if we can let that roll. I don't know if there's any protocol for that with COVID, but 
you know, we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll keep you posted and, and let you guys know. Well, man, I appreciate it, Casey. Thank you so much, man, for coming on. Thank you everything you've done for the sport, man. You really, you really have brought the sport uh, in a progression towards towards what I consider a really bright future for it. We just need to fix some shit going on in inline. Exactly. I don't disagree. <laughs> All <laughs> well, right, man, brother. I thanks, appreciate buddy. it, man. Have a safe drive back, buddy. Talk to you later. Bye.